on to the New Mercury nonfiction readings at the wind-up space. My uh, co-conspirator, John Barry, actually had the nerve to go on vacation with his family this week. <laughs> so uh, we'll just have to carry on without him. And we're also without our, our regular bartender, Holly. But this fellow in the Orioles cap, whose name is? Jason. Jason will take good care of all of you. <laughs> Somewhere wandering around, I don't see him, is Russell Ocampo, the owner-operator of the wind-up space, which has been our home since the summer of 2010. And we're so grateful to Russell and to the wind-up space for letting us have this little literary soiree every month. Um, for those of you who haven't been to the New Mercury before, um, John Barry and I founded the New Mercury in the winter of 2010 because at that time Baltimore did not have a dedicated nonfiction reading series. There were some great fiction reading series like uh, the 510 series at Minas Gallery, both now sadly defunct, um, but remembered by all of us who used to attend those readings. They were tremendous fun. Uh, but as I said, there was no nonfiction reading series, and John and I as nonfiction writers knew that there were so many great writers of nonfiction in Baltimore, memoirists, journalists, uh, science writers, food writers, you name it, they run the gamut. And over the past few years, we've been, um, had the privilege of hosting many of Baltimore's nonfiction writers. Um, we're so happy that you all came out tonight. So without any further ado, let's get started. Uh, our first reader tonight is Elizabeth Dahl. Elizabeth writes for adults and children from her home in Baltimore. Her essays, short stories, and poems have appeared at NPR.org, at The Rumpus, and Johns Hopkins Magazine, and elsewhere. Her first book, an illustrated novel for children entitled Jeannie Wishes, was published by Abrams Books in 2013. And you can visit her online at ElizabethDahl.com. Elizabeth. Everybody. Thanks, Deborah. Um, my ears are really clogged up, and they have been for the past few days, so I have a little trouble figuring out when I'm speaking at the right volume. So if you guys cannot hear something, really? Okay. If you can, <laughs> we've already got a problem here. Um, all right, so I will try to project well. Um, I do write a little more fiction than nonfiction, but I love writing nonfiction. Um, I'm gonna read three very short essays. The first one, um, you guys are probably familiar with the website, The Rumpus. Occasionally they have, or they used to have a series where they would, they called it Reader's Write, and they would throw out a topic, and you would, you know, readers would send in submissions, and if they liked them, they would put them on the site. So this is one of them. Um, it's called Night Watch, and it's about a time in my life. I grew up in Baltimore, in, um, and it doesn't specify it in the essay, but it was in Oakenshaw. Um, basically, if you guys don't know that, it's near Union Memorial Hospital in Hopkins. It's just uh, north of Charles Village. Night Watch. First, there was an enclave in an enclave, a bedroom I shared with my mother, on the third floor of her parents' modest row house at the heart of their modest city neighborhood, four blocks square. A land of tall oaks and summer block parties. A skate down the street, sled in the alley, kind of stable, predictable place with lots of other kids. It was the room in the house, in the neighborhood, in the city, state, country, continent, hemisphere, planet, galaxy, universe. Just like the big blue marble said, just like I thought when I looked at world book maps. Not long after I turned eight, my mother rented an apartment on the first floor and basement of another row house, just her and me with separate bedrooms, one block from my grandparents on the southern edge of the same neighborhood. Instead of a street, we now lived on a parkway, our back to the oak-lined enclave. Our front door faced a busy nine-story hospital set back on its lot Rectangular windows, each a patient room, lined its red brick face. Gowned windows would appear in the windows sometimes, solitary and dark against the fluorescent backlight. Sometimes, I thought, they were looking at me. 
All night, the hospital rooms would go light, then dark, as nurses made their rounds. Ambulances would wail past. Sometimes fire engines would arrive, responding to alar alarms, small and large. Discharged ER patients would knock on the door, looking for bus fare. On active nights, my mother and I would pad around in our nightgowns, deciding which doorbells she should answer, which fire alarms were false, and which real. We had new neighbors on the block, different kinds of neighbors than we'd had before. Single nurses, frat boys, widows. But the gowned patients were our neighbors too. Like them, we looked out windows for answers. It felt like life on the front line, the night watch. For me, it was a less neighborly neighborhood. For my mother, it was the price of independence. Okay, so then I became a parent. <laughs> this piece has been, um, I've treated it as both fiction and creative nonfiction, but it's actually creative nonfiction, really. It's called In the Bed. From the first night home, the baby slept in the bed. It was how the mother could rest. The father did not say no. After all, he did not have the breasts. He looked out the window and formed opinions about the garden instead. The mother made a poster with a blocky design, the kind the books said the baby could see. The father saw to the car seats anchoring. The baby slept between them on his back, beneath the white sheet. He was a warm sliver of a thing. It was June and balmy outside. They loved the baby's hands and the gang signs he'd flash as he slept. They loved the baby's breath, which smelled like weak, milky tea. The baby was smiling now. He could lie on his stomach and push up like a wrestler. The baby could squeeze a toy shape like a Labrador and laugh when it barked. When the mother worked, the father was with the baby. When the father worked, the mother was with the baby. The baby was still in the bed. When they went to change a diaper, they'd see the crib, its lime green sheet, bright, unwrinkled. The mother fretted. The father wondered aloud. Were they hurting the baby? The mother and father read Ferber. They asked friends for advice. They took the baby to the crib and let the timed crying happen. But the baby's eyes hung dark with bags and fatigue lodged in the mother's throat like a piece of stuck apple. The baby came back to the bed. The baby pushed Cheerios around his high chair's plastic tray. His first hair fell out and his new hair came in like chick fluff. The baby made sounds that meant dog and cat and learned to crawl, pulling books off low shelves. The baby still slept in the bed. The mother read the Dr. Sears books. Their children had all grown up in the bed and left of their own accord. A teenager in the bed, it would never happen. The mother could, <laughs> the mother could hear them, William and Martha Sears, laughing through the page at the thought. The mother told the father. They tried to believe it. The baby went to Gymboree. He learned the alphabet. He lost his first teeth and married the girl from math class during recess. He started every night in his own bed. The mother and father consoled themselves with that. But after a few hours alone, he would still drift in with the mother and father. Whenever she thought about it, the mother felt her neck muscles turn steely. She stopped talking to others about the sleeping arrangement, mentioning it only when another parent hinted at something similar. She thought again of the Sears's snug inside the pages of their book. How could they be so sure? The baby read Harry Potter and learned the multiplication tables. He developed a SpongeBob habit and visited the orthodontist. He dressed as a Jedi for Halloween. But every day, while the parents slept, he would still drift into the bed. He was far more than a sliver now, and the bed was a crowded place. Charts were created, bribes offered, but they were paper and hollow and no match for the bed. <laughs> the baby would soon be learning long division. <laughs> Ahead lay what? Protractors? Mixers? Babies could not come home from senior proms and climb into their parents' beds. <laughs> Finally, the parents had an idea. The baby loves Legos and wanted every last set, especially the biggest, the Death Star. The Death Star was extravagant 
far more than any one baby should have, said the mother. But if the promise of a Death Star could help end the baby's bed days, it would be worth it. The baby listened to the offer. He liked it. Soon, the baby was visiting the bed only to match, watch movies or play with the dogs, never to sleep. When the boxed Death Star thudded onto the porch one day, the baby set to work, flooding his bedroom rug with the blocks, then working page by page through the instructions. Block upon block, Layer upon layer, the gray sphere took shape. The bed was a new place now, with a space in the center that felt surprisingly large, larger even than the baby himself had been. The mother and father looked at each other. Was there a manual for this? The father looked out the window and formed opinions about the garden instead. So. Okay, and this last one, um, I went to Hopkins, and uh, last year, the Johns Hopkins Magazine asked if I would write, they always have a personal essay on the back page, which some of you guys may have seen. And they gave me a lot of latitude uh, about what I wanted to write about, but there was one thing that was pretty, pretty strong in my mind. Um, and the person I'm discussing in this essay lived in Baltimore for a long time. His name was Court, uh, Court McNeil, or Courtright McNeil, and he was both in investments, he attended Hopkins, he did investments, but he was also a writer. And he uh, was co-founder of a journal called Murderland, which did crime, crime fiction, I think. So this is set in the college days. And it's called Collegiality. As the radiators in our Gilman Hall basement classroom clang, clang, clang to life one frigid February morning, my introductory poetry class embarked on our first workshop period. A freshman named Courtright McNeil, or Court as he'd scrawled in all caps atop the page, passed around his poem, Among the Dead. A description of a boy taking a girl to an art museum before taking her home to bed. The poem was beautiful, coarse, stark, and funny. A junior that year, I hadn't expected a freshman to produce something so good, especially not right out of the gate. The guy could write, that much was clear, but as the course went on, course Court also proved to be a gracious workshopper who gave and received feedback with equal zeal. He took everyone's work as seriously as he did his own. Whenever Court read poems out loud, his or anyone else's, He'd lean forward, his whole body engaged. His face might get red. He might sweat. Outside the classroom lay winter, a world frozen as if in marble. Inside the classroom, we had the radiators and court. Relationships are often valued for their vastness and growth, but my connection to court became special for its limits. We had no mutual friends. We weren't hanging out in the hut, meeting up at parties on the beach, or wandering through art museums together. And that made what we did share, mutual respect for each other as writers and readers, feel that much purer. This, I felt, was what I'd been looking for in college. This was collegiality. In 2008, after not having spoken since our Gilman Hall days, Court and I reconnected on Facebook. From opposite parts of the country, We'd exchange occasional messages about books and writing, agents and publishers. When he read from his first novel, Short, on campus, I attended. Afterward, we talked about, what else? Books. Court died in the spring of 2013 at age 41, a shocking truth I learned of via the same medium that had put us back in touch. He left behind a beautiful family, as well as many admirers and friends. How do you mourn a friend you rarely saw? One whose hometown and favorite drink you couldn't name. The same way you'd mourn anyone else whose presence in the world seemed so vital, profoundly and for the rest of your life. I won't ever forget Court or how he brought spring to that poetry workshop long before it was due. <laughs>